Hello and welcome to Vanguard Audiobooks. I'm Alex Slender and you can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com where you're welcome to join. We're going to pick up with Imperium today. <clears throat> we'll start with the chapter, Two Aspects of History. Now Imperium is about 650 pages divided into about maybe five main sections or books. I don't think he calls them books, but subsections or sub books that comprise the whole and... Uh, each of them has maybe 10 chapters, so 5 or 6, 10, throw in another 100 pages, and you've got Imperium. It's kind of a one man's take on Spengler, updating Spengler right after uh, World War II. And we went into last time the difference between uh, causality, material causality, and the idea of uh, sort of innate organic inner direction that things carry out and outer incidents might determine their fate that is more or less fate is more or less outcome whereas destiny is inner direction that cannot be altered is this is the kind of distinction he's making we heard about that last if you listen to our <coughs> recording of the uh, start of the of the book let's pick it up now with the two aspects of history is the next chapter and he has these as sort of four pages four pages eight it's not like a conventional book where every you know chapter is 25 pages and it's 250 pages long. It's it's sort of, remember, he's doing this without any books. He just kind of left his family and just went over to Ireland in British Bay, and he's sitting there in a cottage writing this off the top of his head with no books around, kind of uh, out of his own ideas and vast knowledge of what he has read. So this is kind of the scene. This is where this springs from. Spengler's idea, again, Spengler was uh, the, the idea that history is made up of unique expressions of high culture most of which are come from whites ultimately if you trace it back and they're each individual unique growths and they're never to be repeated in history and they all follow more or less parallel form organically anything that's organic must die so it has the the whole cycle just as a man in an individual life has a cycle so <clears throat> we're not saying this is true but this is what Spengler believed and this is what Yaki believed as well and so the two aspects of history, the total difference between the methods of human thinking represented by the central ideas of destiny on the one hand and causality on the other. Causality, again, would be for inorganic stuff and destiny is for organic stuff, life and the nation, the man, the nation, and ultimately the culture. And he's saying nations are organs in the body that is Europe, and that's what the Imperium is, all of Europe coming together as one, kind of what Hitler tried. Remember, his book is dedicated to the hero of the Second War, who he doesn't name, but he obviously means Hitler, because he is trying to unite Europe in a racial defense of itself against the Jewish Bolsheviks, who mass murdered tens of millions of our people. And so, Yaki is carrying on Hitler's political effort, and He's carrying on because he says it's a book of it's not even a book, it's just in book form. It's action taken by Europe is what Imperium represents, he says at the start. History is the record of fulfilled destinies, of cultures, nations, religions, philosophies, sciences, mathematics, art forms, <clears throat> great men. Only the feeling of empathy can understand these once living souls from the bare records left. Causality is helpless here, for at every second a new fact is cast into the pool of life, and from its point of impact, ever-widening circles of changes spread out. The subterranean facts are never written down, but every fact changes the course of the history of facts. The true understanding of any organism, whether a high culture, a nation, or a man, is to see behind and underneath the facts of that existence to the soul which is expressing itself by means of and often in opposition to the external happenings. This reminds me of something in uh, studying literature. He was his own elimination, or like the man is kind of something burning within, and all you see are the outward embers or ashes of the inner driving soul. That was from, I think, Pale Fire by um, Nabokov, or Nabokov. I remember a very horrible book we had to read on uh, uh, one of the various courses I had, but uh, I remember that phrase. Like something is burning within, and the outer, the physical, or whatever is kind of the the result of that. He's kind of expressing a similar idea here. 
saying we have to see behind and underneath the facts, the external facts, to the existence of the soul, which is expressing itself by means of, and often in opposition to, the external happenings. Only so can one separate what is significant from what is unimportant. Significant, thus, is seen to mean having a destiny quality. Incidental means without relationship to destiny. It was destiny for Napoleon that Carnot was minister of war, C-A-R-N-O-T, for another man would probably not have seen Napoleon's project for an invasion of Italy through the Ligurian hills, buried as it was in the files of the ministry. It was a destiny for France that the author of the plan was a man of action as well as a theoretician. It is thus obvious that the feeling for what is destiny and what is incident have a high subjective content and that a deeper insight can make out destiny where the more superficial sees only incident. Men are thus differentiated also with regard to their capacity for understanding history. There is an historical sense which can see behind the surface of history to the soul that is determinant of this history. History seen through the historical sense of a human being has thus a subjective aspect. This is the first aspect of history. The other, the objective aspect of history, is equally incapable of rigid establishment, even though at first glance it might seem to be. The writing of purely objective history is the aim of the so-called reference or narrative method of presenting history. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it inevitably selects and orders the facts, and in this process, the poetic int intuition historical sense and flair of the author come into play. If these are totally excluded, the product is not history writing, but a book of dates, and this again cannot be free from selection. Nor is it history. The genetic method of writing history attempts to set forth the developments with complete impartiality. It is the narrative method with some type of causal, evolutionary, or organic philosophy superimposed to trace the growth of the subsequent out of the precedent. This fails to obtain objectivity because the facts that survive may be either too few or too numerous, and in either case, artistry must be employed in filling in the gaps or selecting. Nor is impartiality possible. It is the historical sense which decides importance of past developments, past ideas, past great men. For centuries, Brutus and Pompey were held to be greater than Caesar. Around 1800, Vulpius was considered a greater poet than Goethe. Mengs, whom we have forgotten, was ranked in his day as one of the great painters of the world. Shakespeare, until more than a century after his death, was considered inferior as a playwright to more than one of his contemporaries. El Greco was unnoticed 75 years ago. Cicero and Cato were both held, until after the First World War, to be great men rather than culture-retarding weaklings. Joan of Arc was not included in Chastelaine's list, drawn up on the death of Charles the Seventh, of all the army commanders who fought against England. Lastly, for the benefit of readers of 2050, ding, 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 I may say that the hero and the philosopher of the period 1900 to 1950 were both invisible to their contemporaries in the historical dimensions in which you see them. He's saying that Time will elevate figures and suppress others, and it changes according to our evaluations. The classical culture looked one way to Winkelmann's time, another way to Nietzsche's time, yet another way to the 20th and 21st centuries. Similarly, Elizabethan England was satisfied with Shakespeare's dramatization of Plutarch Caesar, whereas Fond de Sickle, end of century, England required Shaw to dramatize Momsen's Caesar. Momsen was a historian. Wilhelm Tell, Maria Stuart, Goetz von Berlingen, Berlingen, Berlickingen, Florian Geyer, all would have to be written differently today, for we see these historical periods from a different angle. What, then, is history? History is the relationship between the past and the present. Because the present is constantly changing, so is history. Each age has its own history, which the spirit of the age creates to fit its own soul.
with the passing of that age never to return, that particular history picture has passed. Seen from this standpoint, any attempt to write history as it really happened is historical immaturity, and the belief in objective standards of history presentation is self-deception, for what will come forth will be the spirit of the age. The general agreement of contemporaries with a certain outlook on history does not make that outlook objective, but only gives it rank, the highest possible rank it can have as an accurate expression of the spirit of the age, true for this time and this soul. <clears throat> That's an interesting idea. He's saying don't get caught up in establishing the actual facts, but try to pull out the, the, the spirit of the age and that how people felt back then, including how they felt about history and the passing scene. And that's, <clears throat> in a sense, it echoes what Hunter Thompson said. My concern with truth is not on a nickel and dime level, which is a very, very, very dangerous game to be playing. Now, I would personally, this is an example I, where I think both are right. <clears throat> I think that in some kinds of very specialized focused history, of course it's important to get the facts as exactly right as you can, but he's also right that you got to stand back and appreciate the greater picture so that both the Impressionist to switch to painting, the Impressionist of a Monet or a Manet, is just as valid an approach to painting as the incredibly detailed of a Van Eyck. Microscopic view, you see? <clears throat> That's how I would look at it anyway. But uh, to continue... True for this time and this soul, he's saying. A higher degree of truth cannot be attained, this side of divinity. Anyone who prates of being modern must remember that he would have felt just as modern in the Europe of Charles V, and that he is doomed to become just as old-fashioned to the men of 2050 as are the men of 1850 to him, thereby refuting the absurdity of the progressive. Oh my God, this is 2016 and you still believe that? A journalistic view of history stamps its possessor as lacking in the historical sense. He should therefore refrain from talking of historical matters, whether past or in the process of becoming. That ends that brief little chapter. And now we pick up the next one, the relativity of history. And I don't know how long we're going to run today, but I'll, whatever chapter is around, probably the hour mark might be good. Sometimes I'll do 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, but one of those three generally. The relativity of history. And he, these are chapters are not numbered, which is why I'm not giving you a number. <clears throat> the relativity of history. History must always have its subjective aspect and its objective aspect, but the determining thing is always neither the one nor the other, but simply the relationship between the two. Each of the first two aspects can be arbitrary, but the relationship is not arbitrary, but is the expression of the spirit of the age, and is therefore true, historically speaking. Each of the eight cultures which passed in brilliant review before us had its own relationship to history generally, and this relationship developed in a certain direction through the life course of the culture. It is only necessary to mention the classical in this connection. Tacitus, Plutarch, Livy, Suetonius were regarded as historical thinkers by the Romans. To us they are simply storytellers, totally lacking in the historical sense. This could not be a reflection on them, but only tells us something about ourselves. Our view of history is as intense, fierce, probing, and extensive as the whole cast of our Western soul, generally. If there were ten millennia of history instead of five, we would find it necessary to orient ourselves to the whole ten instead of to the mere five. Not only are the cultures differentiated from one another also in their historical sense, but the various ages within the culture's development are so distinguished. Although all tendencies exist in all ages, it is nevertheless correct to say that one certain life tendency dominates any one age. Thus in all cultures the religious feeling is uppermost in the first great life phase, lasting some five centuries, and is then superseded by the critical spirituality, lasting somewhat less long to be succeeded by the historical outlook, which gradually merges again into the final rebirth of religion. The three life tendencies are, successively, sacred, profane, and skeptical. They parallel the political phases of feudalism, corresponding to religion, absolute state, and democracy, corresponding to early and late critical philosophy, and resurgence of authority and Caesarism, the counterparts of skepsis and rebirth of religion.
Not only are the cultures differentiated from one another, also in their historical sense, but the various ages within the culture's development are so distinguished. Although all tendencies exist in all the ages, it is nevertheless correct to say that one certain life tendency dominates any one age. Thus, in all cultures, the religious feeling is uppermost in the first great life phase, lasting some five centuries, and is then superseded by the critical spirituality, lasting somewhat less long, to be succeeded by the historical outlook, which gradually merges again into the final rebirth of religion. The three life tendencies are successively sacred, profane, and skeptical. They parallel the political phases of feudalism corresponding to religion, semicolon, absolute state and democracy corresponding to the early and late critical philosophy, and resurgence of authority and Caesarism, the counterparts of skepsis and rebirth of religion. I think I just reread all that, but can't hurt. The intercultural development of the idea of science or natural philosophy is from theology through, in succession, physical sciences and biology to pure, untheoretical nature manipulation, the scientific counterparts of skepsis and resurgent authority. I don't know about all this, but it's hard to say. The age, it's a little too near. Oh, so you're just going to say for sure that the religious phase is going to last 500 years. I, to me, that's... Really? Is that true? I can't judge whether that's true or not, but I certainly would not accept that just from his stating it. Now, the age which succeeds to the age of democracy can only see its predecessors under their purely historical aspect. This is the only way it can feel itself as related to them. This too, however, will, as will be apparent, has its imperative side. Culture man is always a unity, and the mere fact that one life tendency is uppermost cannot destroy this organic unity. In all ages, the individuals therein are separated from one another also by their varying development of the historical sense. Think of the different historical horizon of Frederick II and one of his Sicilian court courtiers, of Caesar Borgia and one of his captains, of Napoleon and Nelson, of Mussolini and his assassin. A political unit in the custody of a man with no historical horizon, an opportunist, must pay with its wasted blood for his lack. Just as the Western culture has the most intensely historic soul, so does it develop men with the greatest historical sense. It is a culture which has always been conscious of its own history. At each turning point, there were many who knew the significance of the moment. Both sides in any Western opposition have felt themselves as clothed with and determining the future. Therefore, Western men have been under the necessity of having a history picture in which to think and act. The fact that the culture was continually changing meant that history was continually changing. History is the continuous reinterpretation of the past. Now, he's almost echoing wild here. The one duty we owe history is to rewrite it. Oscar Wilde said wittily, but also suggestively. And Yaki is saying the same thing in different words for a different reason. History is thus continually true. He says history is the relation of the present to the past. Yaki does. So as our ideas change, as we see things, as we alternately muffle, suppress, or elevate, or lower different figures, we come to a different estimation of the past, and that's fine. It's subjective and relative to the needs of our age, but then there are also individual facts within, and I don't think he's disdaining their being accurately recorded or observed. He's not saying to lie about it. He's saying that <clears throat> maybe it's more important to look at the spirit of an age than the concrete facts, even. History is the continuous reinterpretation of the past. History is thus continually true, because in each age, the ruling historical outlook and values are the expression of the proper soul. The alternatives for history are not true or false, but effective or ineffective. Truth in the religio-philosophical-mathematical sense, meaning timelessly, eternally valid, dissociated from the conditions of life, uh, formally true like a math uh, apothems or something, is not what history is, does not pertain to history. History that is true is history that is effective in the minds of significant men. The highly refined historical sense is the characteristic of two groups, history writers and history makers. Between these two groups also there is an order of rank. 
History writing has the task of setting forth for the age its necessary picture of the past. This picture, clear and articulate, then becomes effective in the thoughts and actions of the leading history makers of the age. This age, like others, has its own appropriate history picture, and it cannot choose one of a number of pictures. The determining thing in our outlook on history is the spirit of the age. Ours is an external, factual, skeptical, historical age. It is not moved by great religious or critical feelings. That which to our cultural forebears was the object of joy, sorrow, passion, necessity, is to us the object of respect and knowledge. The center of gravity of our age is in politics. Pure historical thinking is the close relative of political thinking. Historical thinking always seeks to know what was, not to prove something. Political thinking has the first task of ascertaining the facts and the possibilities and then of changing them through action. Both are, undis undisassoci Both are undissociated realism. Neither begins with a program which it desires to prove. Ours is the first age in Western history in which an absolute submission to facts has triumphed over all other spiritual attitudes. It is the natural corollary of an historical age when critical methods have exhausted their possibilities. In the realm of thought, historical thinking triumphs. In the realm of action, politics occupies the center of the stage. We follow the facts, no matter where they may lead, even though we must give up dearly cherished schemes, ideologies, soul fancies, prejudices. Previous ages in Western history formed their history to fit their souls. We do the same, but our view has no precedent ethical or critical equipment in it. On the contrary, our ethical imperative is derived from our historical outlook and not vice versa. Our outlook on history is no more arbitrary than that of any other age of the West. It is compulsory for us, in italics. Each man will have this outlook, and his level of significance will depend on the focus in these matters which he can attain and hold. Insofar as man is an effective representative of this time, he has this particular history picture and no other. It is not a question of whether he should have it. So to read is completely to misunderstand. He will have it in his feelings and unconscious valuation of events, even if not in his articulate verbal ideas. And that ends that uh, section. Next up is the meaning of facts. Whether or not a man's history outlook is also intellectually formulated as well as effective in his unconscious doing, thinking, and valuing is merely a function of his general personality. That is, whether his history outlook is also intellectually formulated. Some men have a greater inner need to think abstractly than others. Remember, Yaki is supposed to have 170 IQ, so that's effectively pretty much off the chart. Uh, <clears throat> basically means you're smarter than anyone else, pretty much, at that level. It must not be supposed that the sense for facts, the historical sense, dispenses with creative thinking. Development of fact sense is primarily the seeing of what is there, without ethical or critical preconceptions of what should or should not be there, might or might not. Life facts are the data of history. A life fact is something which has happened. It does not matter to its status as a fact that no one may know of it, that it has vanished without a trace. Obviously, creative thinking enters into the process of interpreting the data of history, and a moment's reflection shows also that the process of assessing the data of history is a creative one. Assessing the data of history is creative. Physical facts like resistance, sourness, redness are accessible to everyone. Life facts, hyphenated, but not capitalized F. Life facts are not accessible to a man who has a rigid view of history and who knows that the purpose of all previous happening was to make this age possible, who knows that history has the sole meaning of, quote, progress, unquote. Remnants of social ethics, preconceived historical notions, utility dogmas, all shut out their victims from inner participation in the life of the 20th and 21st centuries. To this century, the new vista now opens of assembling the lost facts in previous ages and previous cultures. Not tiny incidental data, but the broad outline of necessary organic developments that must have taken place. 
from our knowledge of past cultures and their structures, we can kill or we can fill in missing developments in some, for, in some from what has survived in others. Most important to us now alive, we can fill in what remains to the fulfillment of our own culture. This can be done in the way that a paleo, paleontologist can reconstruct in broad outlines an entire organism from a single skull fragment. The process is legitimate and trustworthy in both cases, for life has patterns in which it actualizes its unique individuals. From an anonymous work of literature remaining, a creative thinker can reconstruct a general picture of the unknown author. Can one not draw accurately the sole portrait of the unknown author of Das Büchlein vom Vollkommenen Leben? The little book of the uh, perfected life, I think is what that is. So also can the Crusades period of a culture be reconstructed if one has knowledge of its Reformation stage or its Enlightenment phase. The realm of thought is interested in the missing stages of past cultures and the future of our own, but action is interested in the past only as the key to effective performance. Thus, the higher importance of history writing and history thinking is that they serve effective action. And remember what he says about his own book, that this book is only in book form, but it is an act. The fact sense is only operative when dogma, socio-ethical ideals, and critical trappings are put aside. To the fact sense, it is important that hundreds of millions of people in a certain area believe in the truth of Confucian doctrines. To the fact sense, it is meaningless whether or not these doctrines are true, even though to religion, progress ideologies, and journalism, the truth or falsehood of Confucianism is important. To a 21st century history writer, the most important thing about the cells, ether waves, bacille, electrons, and cosmic rays of our times will be that we believe them in them. All of these notions, which the age considers facts, will vanish into the one fact for the 21st century that a, once upon a time this was a world picture of a certain kind of culture man. So do we look upon the nature theories of Aristarchus and Democritus in the classical culture. And thus, facts too have their subjective and objective content. And again, it is the relationship between the man and the phenomenon that determines the form of the fact. Each culture has in this way its own facts, which arise out of its own problems. What the fact is depends on what man is, <clears throat> on what man is experiencing the phenomenon, whether he belongs to a high culture capital H and capital C always, to which culture, to which age thereof, so high culture versus just primitive static stuff, like Aborigines, and then which of the high cultures of the 8 or 9 or 10 or 11 that there were, supposedly I think 9 discussed by Spengler, to which age within the culture, like the the religious, the scientific, the, the religious profane, and then the uh, skeptical, he's saying, to which nation, which organ within the culture, and to which spiritual stratum, and to which social stratum. All these help determine what a fact means. The facts of the Second World War are one thing in the year 18, 1948, in the brains of the culture-bearing stratum of Europe, and something totally different in the minds of the newspaper-reading herds. By 2000, the view of the present culture-bearing stratum will have become also the view of the many, and by that time, more facts will be known to the independent thinkers about the same war than are known now to the few. How about that? Certainly true. For one of the characteristics of life facts is that distance, particularly temporal distance, that is distance in time, shows up their lineaments more clearly. We know more of imperial history than Tacitus knew, more of Napoleonic history than Napoleon knew, vastly more of the First World War than its creators and participants knew, and Western men in 2050 will know our times in a way that we can never know them. To Brutus, his mythological ancestry was a fact, but to us a more important fact is that he believed it. Thus the fact sense, the prerequisite of the historical outlook of the 20th century, emerges as a form of the poetry of life. It is the very opposite of the prosaic, drab insistence on the materialistic outlook that facts had to submit to a progress ideology in order to be cognized as significant. This view absolutely excluded its victims from any insight into the beauty and power of the facts of history, as well as from any understanding of their significance. 
The 21st century, whose men will be born into a time when this historical outlook is self-evident, will find it fantastic, if it ever takes notice of it, in that in earlier times men believed that all previous history was merely tending toward them. And yet that was the outlook of the 19th century. Whole cultures, equal by birth and spirituality to our own in every way, lived and died merely that the Philistinism of the progress ideologist could chalk up their, quote, achievements, unquote, on the wall, meaning a few notions or technical devices. And that's the end of uh, that particular segment. <clears throat> Next up is the demise of the linear view of history. And we'll make this our last uh, sub subsection for today. The demise of the linear view of history, and this would be the I believe the sort of the biblical or Old Testament view of history being the record of God choosing the Jews and making the covenant <clears throat> with the Israelites, who are not the Jews, but of course they claim that for rhetorical reasons. Life is a continuous battle between young and old, old and new, innovation and tradition. Ask Galileo, Bruno, Servetus, Copernicus, Gauss. All of them represented the future. Yet all were overcome, in one way or another, during their own lives by the enthroned past. Copernicus was afraid to publish during his lifetime, lest he be burnt as a heretic. Gauss only revealed his liberating discovery of non-Euclidean geomet geometries after his death for, the fear, <clears throat> for fear of the clamor of the Boeotians. I think that's pronounced. It is therefore not surprising when the materialists persecute by maligning, by conspiracy of silence, cutting off from access to publicity or by driving to suicide, as in the case of Haushofer, those who think in 20th century terms and specifically reject the methods and conclusions of 19th century materialism. The 20th century view of history has to make its way over the ruins of the linear scheme, which insisted on seeing history as a progression from an ancient through a medieval to a modern. I say ruins, for the scheme collapsed decades ago, but they are heavily defended ruins. Hidden in them are the materialists, the posthumous inhabitants of the 19th century, the progress Philistines, progress in quotes, the social eth ethicians, social ethics, the superannuated devotees of critical philosophy, the ideologists of every description whatever. Common to them all is rationalism. They assume as a tenet of faith that history is reasonable that they themselves are reasonable, and that therefore history has done and will do what they think it should. The origin of the three-stage view of history is found in St. Joachim of Flores, a Gothic religionist who put forward the three stages of, as a mystical progression. It was left for the increasing coarseness of intellect, devoid of soul, to make their progression a materialistic utilitarian one. For two centuries now, each generation has regarded itself as the peak of all the previous striving in the world. This shows that materialism is also a faith, a crude caricature of the precedent religion. It is supplanted now, not because it is wrong, for a faith can never be injured by refutation, but because the spirit of the age is devoid of materialism. The linear scheme was more or less satisfactory to Western man, as long as he knew nothing of history outside the Bible, classic authors, and Western chronicles. Even then it would not have held up if the philosophy of history had not been a neglected field of endeavor. However, a little over a century ago began a spate of archaeological investigation, including excavations and deciphering of original inscriptions in Egypt, Babylonia, Greece, Crete, China, and India. It continues today and now also includes Mexico and Peru. The result of these investigations was to show the historically-minded Western civilization that it was by no means unique in its historical grandeur, but that it belonged to a group of high cultures of similar structure and of equal elaboration and splendor. The Western culture is the first to have had both the intense historical impetus as well as the geographic situation to develop a thorough archaeology which includes now within its purview the whole historical world, just as Western politics at one time embraced the whole surface of the earth. The results of this profound archaeological science broke down the old-fashioned linear scheme regarding history. 
he was utterly unable to fit in the new wealth of facts. Since there was some geographic, even though no historical, community between the Egyptian, Babylonian, classical, and Western cultures, it had been able to distort them somehow into a picture that could convince those who already believed. But with the opening up of the history of the cultures, capital C, that were fulfilled in India, China, Arabia, Mexico, Peru, this view could no longer convince even believers. Furthermore, the materialistic spirit, which had posited the influence of preceding cultures on subsequent ones, meanwhile died out, and the new psychological outlook on life recognized the primacy of the soul, the inner purity of the soul, and the superficiality of the process of borrowing of externalia. The new feeling about history was actually coeval with the tremendous outburst of archaeological activity which broke down the old linear scheme. The new outlook became a sole necessity of Western civilization at the same time that the history-seeking activity did, even though it was to remain half-articulate until the First World War. This intense outburst of probing of the past was an expression of a super-personal feeling that the riddle of history was not touched with the old linear device, that it had to be unlocked, that the totality of facts must be surveyed. As the new facts accumulated, the higher-ranking historians took a wider view But not until the latter part of the 19th century did any historian or philosopher actually treat cultures as separate organisms with parallel existence, independence, and spiritual equality. The idea of cultural history itself was a forerunner of this view and was a prerequisite to the development of the 20th century outlook on history. The rejection of the idea that history was merely the record of reigns and battles, treaties and dates, marked an epoch. The feeling spread that universal history was wanted, the combination of the history of politics, law, religion, manners, society, commerce, art, philosophy, warfare, erotic literature, into one great synthesis. Schiller was one of the first to articulate this general need, although both Voltaire and Winkleman had written specific histories along these lines. Hegel, on a spiritual basis, and Comte, the father of sociology, and Buckle, materialistically developed further the idea of total history, i.e. cultural history. Burkhart not only produced a quite perfect example of a cultural history in his Italian Renaissance book, but developed a philosophy of history writing pointing toward the 20th century outlook. Taine, T-A-I-N-E, Lamprecht, Breisig, Nietzsche, Murray, all are milestones in the development away from the linear view of history. In their times, only Nietzsche, and to a lesser extent Burkhardt and Bachhoven, understood the 20th century idea of the unity of a culture. But two generations later, the idea of the unity of a high culture in general, in the highest spiritual stratum of Europe, and has become a prerequisite to both historical and political thinking. What was this linear view of history? was either a mere arbitrary breaking up of historical materials for handling and reference, without any claim to philosophical significance, or else it was an attempt at a philosophy of history. Its pretensions to the latter could not very well hold up in view of the fact that for generations the starting point of modern, of the modern age, has been shifted around from century to century with complete freedom. Each writer has formulated the significance and dates of the three stages differently, and the various formulations exclude one another, but if they are not the same view, why the same terminology? Thus it was no philosophy of history but a mere set of three names which were retained because of a sort of magic which was supposed to inhere in them. Nor was it a satisfactory method of breaking up historical facts for reference purposes since it left no place for China and India, and since it treated the Babylonian and Egyptian in every way the historical equals of the classical and our own, as though they were mere episodes, together constituting a prelude to the classical. For this grotesque history outlook, a millennium in Egypt was a footnote, while ten years in our own century were a volume. The basis of the linear view was cultural egocentricity, or in other words, the unconscious assumption that Western culture was the focus of the whole meaning of all human history that previous cultures had importance only insofar as they contributed something to us, but that in themselves they had no importance whatever. 
This is why the cultures which lived in those areas remote from Western Europe are hardly even mentioned. These famous contributions, what was meant a few was a few technical devices from the Egyptian and Babylonian cultures, and the cultural remains generally of the classical. The Arabian, again, was almost totally ignored for geographic reasons. And yet Western architecture, religion, philosophy, science, music, lyric, manners, erotic, politics, finance, economics, are all totally independent of the corresponding classical forms. It is the archaeological cast of the Western soul, its intensely historical nature, that prompt it to reverence what mere geography might indicate as a spiritual ancestor. And yet, who believes or ever did actually, actually believe that the, com <clears throat> that the Rome of Hildebrand and yet who believes or ever did actually believe that the Rome of Hildebrand, of Alexander the Sixth, of Charles V, or of Mussolini, had any continuity whatever with the Rome of Flaminius, Sulla, Caesar. This whole classicistic yearning of the West, with its two high points in the Italian Renaissance and above all in Winkelmann's movement, was actually nothing but a literary romantic pose. If we had known less of Rome and more of Mecca, Napoleon's title might have been Caliph instead of First Consul, but nothing would have inwardly altered. The endowing of words and names with magic significance is quite necessary and legitimate in religion, philosophy, science, and criticism, but is out of place in an outlook on history. Even in the Italian Renaissance, Francesco Pico wrote against the mania for the classical. Quote, who will be afraid to confront Plato with Augustine, or Aristotle with Thomas, Albert, and Scotus? Savonarola's movement also had cultural as well as religious significance. Into the bonfires went the classical works. The whole classicist tendency of the Italian Renaissance has been too heavily drawn. It was literary, academic, the possession of a few small circles, and those not, leading the, one, and those not the leading ones in thought or action. And yet this movement has been put forward as the link, quote, between two cultures that have nothing in common in order to create a picture of history <clears throat> as a straight line instead of as a spiritually parallel, pure, independent development of high cultures. So he's saying the modern Western culture and the uh, classical culture are not the same at all. To the religious outlook, with its branches, philosophy, and criticism, progress Philistinism, in quotes, progress Philistinism, and social ethics, facts and figure only as proof, and lack any other interest. To the historical outlook, facts are the material sought after, and even doctrines, dogmas, and truths are treated as simply facts. Previous Western Ages were thus satisfied by the linear scheme, despite its complete independence of the facts of history. To the 20th century, however, with its center of gravity in politics, history is not a mere instrument of proving or illustrating any dogma or socio-ethical progress theory, but the source of our effective world outlook. And so, in implicit obedience to the spirit of the age, the leading minds of the 20th century reject the old-fashioned anti-factual linear theory of history. In its place, the spirit of the age has shown the actual structure of human history the history of eight high cultures, each an organism with its own individuality and destiny. The older type of philosophy of history forced the facts to prove some religious, ethical, or critical theory. The 20th century outlook takes its philosophy of history from the facts. The 20th century outlook is nonetheless subjective because it starts from facts. It is merely obeying the inner imperative of its own historical soul in seeing its history picture thus. Our view is nonetheless peculiarly ours because it gives priority to facts. Other types of men, outside the Western culture or beneath it, will never be able to understand it any more than they can understand higher Western mathematics, Western techniques, physics or chemistry, Gothic architecture or the art of the figure, fugue. This picture of history, absolutely compulsory as it is for the leading men of thought of action in the Western civilization, is no more compulsion for the masses that throng in the streets of the western capitals. 
Historical relativity is, like physical relativity, the possession of a few leading minds. History is not experienced nor made in the streets, but on the heights. History is not experienced or made in the streets, but on the heights. The number of men in the Western civilization who are aware of the actual meaning of the Second World War is countable in thousands. That's very interesting. So the vast, vast majority had no idea of the actual purpose they served. Is the corollary to what he says. The, actual, the number of men in Western civilization, in the Western civilization, who are aware of the actual meaning of the Second World War is countable in thousands. Western philosophy from the days of Anselm has always been esoteric. Now remember this Straussian divide of the neocons. You've got the esoteric, the hidden inner meaning known to the few, and the exoteric meaning known to the masses. That is, the lie put out to the masses is that, oh no, the Muslims attacked us. They hate America for our freedom. The inner reality is, well, look, we rigged this with Mossad and the knowledge of CIA and some of the top Bush people. And in order to get the Americans stirred up with a new Pearl Harbor and get them to waste their lives in war to destroy the countries surrounding Israel and make the Middle East safe for Jewish digestion. So that would be the esoteric versus the exoteric. But he just mentioned the esoteric here, and he says Western philosophy from the days of Anselm, with whom I'm not familiar, has always been esoteric. No less so is the, twen <coughs> no less so is the 20th century outlook, and correspondingly small is the number of those for whom it is a sole necessity. I think Anselm was a Christian thinker, I believe. But the number for whom the decisions of these few will be decisive is not numbered in hundreds, but in hundreds of millions. To the 20th century, the regarding of all previous human happening as merely introductory to and preparatory to our own Western history is simply immense naivete. So see, this is what we're getting here is an interesting, we're, we're used to thinking of this stuff as culture, the idea of cultural relativism and the centering of the white man or the centering of the male experience and how it needs to be decentered is current left-wing jargon that you find in all their conferences and papers throughout academia. But yet he is coming at it from a pro-white point of view and saying that, look, we are not the center of history. It wasn't all leading up to us. That's Jewish, essentially, Hebrew, biblical, eth uh, cultural Ethnocent, cultural, eth <clears throat> what did he say? Egocentricity. He said that cultural egocentricity basically related to our Bible. But he's saying actually these cultures are different and independent growths. They all follow a more or less uh, similar pattern outlined by uh, Spengler, and they have to be considered independently. They're not simply influences or prologues to us here today. That's the progressive linear fallacy. I think he's saying it's kind of the same thing. And he's rejecting it. So interesting way he's he's kind of using similar way of thinking to the way left modern leftist academics do it and journalists using their jargon but or very similar wordings, but for a different purpose. They want to instead of they want to disprivilege the white man, decenter white male consciousness decenter Eurocentric standards and impose the static view of the Aborigine type that never develops or evolves. And yet they, they privilege that type by calling it a, a, a culture, even though it really isn't much more than habits as an animal might have. And they want to legally empower it over us. So some very interesting twists and turns in all this, you see. Yaki is, again, not a doctrinaire right-wing type, but a uh, he's kind of partly right-wing, partly left-wing, partly racial, partly spiritual. Just stuff to think about. And so he says, To the 20th century, repeating, the regarding of all previous human happening as merely introductory to and preparatory to see, to our Western history is simply immense naivete. And then that is that mentality is also common to progressivism that, oh, my, whenever they say it's 2016, I can't believe still people still believe that. This idea that things move linearly and become progressively better and better over time and worse and worse as you move into the past. 
is nuts, and he says it's immense naivete. Evolutions that require just as long as our millennium of Western history are contracted into mere causal events. The men in these other cultures are treated as though they were children, dimly trying to attain one or, or another of our specifically Western ideas. But in each of these cultures, the stage was reached and passed that we attained to in the 19th and 20th centuries. Free science, social ethics, democracy, materialism, atheism, rationalism, class war, money, nationalism, annihilation wars, highly artificial living conditions, megalopolitan sophistication, social disintegration, divorce, degeneration of the old arts to mere formlessness, they exhibited all these familiar symptoms. He's saying, we're not unique, we're not alone, these others have gone through all these stages too. The vast amount of historical knowledge of which the 20th century must take account, knowledge unearthed by the historical age which succeeded to the age of criticism, he's saying, again, archaeology, the dis physical discovery of these cultures started to put us in doubt as the uniqueness of our own, perhaps, can tolerate no arbitrary forcing of the facts of history into a preconceived scheme with three magical stages, which must remain even though no one can agree where one begins and the other leaves off, and of which the third stage has been prolonged indefinitely since Professor Horn of Leiden announced in 1667 his discovery of the Middle Ages. The first formulation of the 20th century outlook on history only came with the First World War. Previously, only Breisig had definitely broken with the linear scheme, but his earlier work covered only a part of human history. It was left to Spengler, the philosopher of the age, to set forth the full outline of the structure of history. He himself was the first to recognize the superpersonal nature of his work when he said that an historically essential idea is only in a limited sense the property of him to whose lot it falls to parent it. It was for him to articulate that at which everyone was groping. The view of the others was limited by one or another specialist horizon, and their, pro product <clears throat> and their projects were consequently incomplete, one-sided, top-heavy. Like all products of genius, Spengler's work seems perfectly obvious to those who come afterwards, and again, it was directed to those who come, to come, and not to contemporaries. Genius is always directed toward the future. This is in its nature, and this is the explanation of the usual fate of all works of genius, political and economic, as well as artistic and philosophical, that they are understood in their grandeur and simplicity only by the afterworld of their creators. And I think we'll leave it at there for right now before moving on to chapter 38, or to page 38, The Structure of History. Uh, comes up next. We'll do that uh, tomorrow. Anyway, there we have the idea that cultures are unique, valuable. They go through the same stages, though. And Spengler was kind of the one who outlined this. But uh, we sort of saw Schiller and others needed a development of a universal history, not in the linear sense, which is wrong, but in the sense of appreciating that Ours is not the only culture, and in fact, our modern Western culture is not even the same as the old classical culture, even though it does go through the same stages. So, very distinctive ideas, I think, that he's presenting, and uh, we'll pick it up again uh, very, very soon.